Welcome everyone, I am Monica Lennon, MSP, member of the Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. I would like to welcome you all to the special online edition of the Festival of Politics 2021 in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Futures Forum. Today's panel is titled Fast Fashion and is held in partnership with Zero Waste Scotland. We are delighted that so many people are able to join us online today, and I look forward to hearing your comments and questions as we get into our discussion. Fashion is one of the world's biggest polluters. Even worse, 300,000 tonnes of used clothes are burned or buried in landfill annually. Much of this is unworn as manufacturers dispose of unsold stock. And the UK is one of the worst offenders when it comes to buying disposable clothes, with the average person buying more clothes per capita than any country in Europe. So, how do we help fast fashion fans understand why it's now time to make radical changes in our clothing manufacturing and buying habits? And what exactly are we asking people to do? Well, this panel aims to address all of these questions in the next 60 minutes, so do stay with us. We are delighted that you are all able to join us to take part, and I would encourage you to use the event chat function to introduce yourselves by stating your name and your geographical location, and pose any questions you would like to the, the panel to respond to. And I am very pleased to be joined by our three excellent panellists. They are Lynn Wilson from Circular Economy Wardrobe, Gordon Renouf, co-founder and CEO of Good On You, an ethical brand rating app, and Ian Gulland, Chief Executive of Zero Waste Scotland. However, I would like to begin by asking each of our panellists to describe exactly what is meant by the term fast fashion and to give us some examples that extra, uh, illustrate their definition. I will come first of all to, to Lynn, then to Gordon, and then to Ian. So, Lynn, can I ask you to outline your thoughts, please, and welcome to you. Thank you so much, and, and it's such a pleasure to be here this morning um, talking on such an important um, critical topic, really, in terms of ethical environmental concerns. So. You've asked, um, thanks so much for the question, what's meant by the term fast fashion? And so as a term, fast fashion has evolved since the 80s, and it's used to describe a new accelerated fashion business model. And what does that mean? It involves an increased number of new fashion collections every year, quick turnarounds, and often really low prices. It's about reacting rapidly to offer new products to meet consumer demand, this means that the brand's key focus and investment is in analysing consumer trends, such as fashion house runway shows, what celebrities are wearing and doing, and then translating these styles very quickly so that they can produce them, sell them to the consumer before the original source of the trend, such as a celebrity, has moved on. It is the idea that no one can be seen in the same outfit twice. And if you want to be popular and in fashion, you must walk that look all the time. This, of course, leads to cheap production, exploitation of workers, mainly in Asia, as you mentioned at the start, Monica, but more recently seen in the UK and Leicestershire. And from an environmental perspective, the industry is a drain on global resources related to the vast amounts of energy, water, and raw materials required to produce clothing. And some of the key high street offenders um, are some of our best loved brands at the moment. Um, I'm currently studying at uh, um, research, researching at, at Glasgow University, and I'm sponsored by the Ethical Consumer Research Association. And they recently uh, did uh, some research on high street brands, and they measure ethics, sustainability, and um, uh, politics of a brand, and they rated out of 20 brands like M&S and Primark between zero and three, and brands like Shein at a number four. Whereas 
the best brand, Patagonia, was still at 10 and a half. So that's a really poor rating in terms of taking the whole uh, concept of fashion and how it impacts environmentally and from a, a, a people perspective and the politics of brands. But of course, um, there are some really key offenders that, uh, such as uh, Sheehan at the minute, I would say, is one of the main offenders in terms of um, accessing young people through social media and using uh, social media influencers. And there's lots of jargon associated with that, such as um, having a brand drop, a fashion drop, where, say, 70 to 100 garments are dropped in the one week onto a website. And it's about creating a frenzy, creating an excitement for consumers to, to get ready for the drop. And then clothing can be as much as £1.99 for a little wrap top. And that's just not sustainable, either ethically or environmentally. So, thank you. I'll pass over to my colleagues. Thank you, Lynn. Over to Gordon for his thoughts on fast fashion. <clears throat> Good uh, morning, everybody. It's great to be here, coming from a fair way away. Uh, I hope my accent is able to be understood. Um, so, I agree with everything Lynn said about the nature of the industry, the fast fashion industry, and where it's come from. I think I'd, I'd add three interesting points. One is that another attribute of fast fashion is that it, um, it has a marketing campaign structured around that idea of you want stuff cheap, you want to be changing your fashion, changing your look all the time, that it's you know an essential part of your identity that you'd be doing that. And a lot of people, particularly young people, buy into that. And so that's one of the elements that is very concerning. I think a second element is that, or if we think about why this is a problem, as, as Monica said at the introduction, fashion is a large source of pollution in the current context leading up to the climate summit uh, to COP. Um, we know the UN uh, Environment Programme has identified that fashion is responsible for 8 to 10 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions. And that's about the fifth most polluting industry in the world in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Fashion has a lot of other impacts in terms of it's now, I think, um, more of an impact on forests through the use primarily of viscose than um, the paper industry. Like 30 years ago, we wanted to stop the paper industry chopping down all the trees, and we've got much better at recycling and using sustainable forestry for that. But actually, viscose is now a really important part of deforestation. So there are a lot of uh, environmental impacts, a lot of impacts on workers. Something like 80 million people work in the fashion industry, and most of them women, most of them in developing countries, most of them in poor working conditions, even unsafe working conditions, and very few of them paid a living wage. So we've got all these reasons why we have a problem. We've got all the things Lynn said about the character of the brands that do this. And I think one more thing is that what's changed, I think, in the last 10 years is that brands have become aware that they need to be saying something about their sustainability, that people are kind of, at least some of their customers are onto them and they have higher expectations. And so that gives rise to certain kinds of greenwashing. It also gives rise to a bit of a hierarchy in which fast fashion brands are doing stuff and which fast fashions are not doing anything. By stuff, I mean positive steps for the environment and labour. And so Good On You rates uh, more than 3,000 fashion brands for their impact on people, planet and animals. And a lot of the large, famous fast fashion brands score two or even three out of five on our system. Uh, but a lot of the newer brands are scoring one. So in that, in that latter category, we're talking about brands like Fashion Nova or Romway or Sheen, as, uh, as Lynn had mentioned. And, and what we do see is brands trying to address some of their impacts and some of the bigger, more established brands like H&M and Zara are doing more than some of these newer entrants like Sheen and, and Fashion Nova. And what we see is uh, a real, a kind of a mix of doing stuff that's real and doing stuff which is greenwashing. So when a brand says, hey, we've got this organic cotton line, we're using sustainable materials, but it's only 1%, half a percent of their production, it gives them a nice glow. I feel good because I'm buying from a brand. And I, I went into that shop because they have organic stuff, but actually they have much. And I like that dress and that one and that one, and none of them use organic cotton. Um, so 
a researcher recently looked at Shein and they make tens of thousands of dress styles at any one time. And they go on about how they use good materials, for example, recycled content. She could count 64 dresses out of tens of thousands that actually use that preferable material. So I'll stop there. So the three points I'm making, they're marketing at you. Um, they're having a really bad environmental labor impact. And there's this emerging tend to position themselves as sustainable or slightly sustainable when they're not. Thank you, Gordon, and thank you for joining us from Australia today. I think uh, Ian is next, and he's, I think, still in Scotland. He's still quite, quite close to, to where I am just now. But um, Ian, what does fast fashion mean to you? Yeah, yeah no, thanks, Monica. Uh, I'm not sure I can add too much more from what the previous presenters have said. I mean, certainly from a zero with Scotland point of view, this this you know, fast fashion is now much more, uh, well, it's very much aligned to the kind of throwaway culture that we have. You know, we, we talk about this, you know, when we talk about plastics and, and litter, et cetera, and uh, other products. And unfortunately, fashion has, has entered that sphere as well, uh, that, you know, we, you know, in terms of the consumption and just people uh, throw the stuff away. They use it once, they wear it once, as uh, the other presenters have said, and then, it, you know, just get discarded. And that obviously creates another problem in terms of, uh, you know, sending stuff to landfill or, as you said, to, to burn it and, uh, you know, causing for, far more uh, problems in terms of pollution. So, uh, certainly, Zero Waste Scotland, we're very keen to, to, to halt that throwaway culture and uh, address the whole issue of consumption, not just in fashion, uh, but our consumption in fashion is contributing significantly to Scotland's carbon footprint. Uh, you know, we produced a report earlier this summer that for every uh, the average person in Scotland consumes 18.4 tonnes of materials uh, every year. Uh, so fashion is part of that, uh, and that's a significant. So scientists would say that a more sustainable level of consumption is eight tonnes per person per year, uh, and we're obviously over, over double that. So fashion it makes up a big part of that, uh, and as other presenters have said, that the impact of that now, not just in climate change, but uh, you know, significant contributor to biodiversity loss through you know deforestation, etc. So another crisis that we are all facing uh, globally uh, in terms of our natural systems. So our role as Airways Scotland is obviously like others to point that out and uh, work with uh, individual companies to to look at different uh, models, circular economy models. Uh, so we work with a number of companies to develop new business models around rental or lease uh, company just down uh, from where I live in Stirling, Seoda, uh, who rents out clothing to uh, women's clothing uh, very ethically, uh, just a, a, a new start company over the last 18 months. Uh, we also work with uh, the Revolve Network, which is over 140 you know, second-hand shops uh, across the whole of Scotland who provide, and part of our the Revolve Network is really to mainstream reuse uh, not just in clothing, but in furniture and bikes, etc. Uh, in, in the high street, uh, provide a, a very, you know, a worthwhile shopping experience as well, which is, you know, which is part of that raising the profile of uh, reuse. Uh, and that we've seen that grow and develop over the, certainly over the last uh, couple of years. Obviously, there's been impacts on uh, from COVID. So our role is really to try and demonstrate that there are alternatives, uh, alternative business models, and obviously alternatives for consumption uh, consumers uh, who are now. You know, I think there is a shift. Um, she will talk a bit more about that. I think there is a much more shift from consumers wanting to, uh, certainly wanting to reduce their impact on climate change, wanting to uh, shop more ethically for all the reasons that people have said around, uh, you know, the, the ethics involved in this. Uh, so there are solutions, and it's really about how do we promote them and uh, work with businesses to deliver them at pace here in Scotland. Thank you, Ian and Lynn and Gordon, for your expertise setting the, the scene very, very nicely. Um, I just wonder then, where is the high street right now in terms of ethical and sustainable clothing production here in 2021? Um, you know, Gordon, um, you've got your, your brand rating app. Perhaps I can come to you first of all on that. Yeah, we recently, I mean, one of the first things that we would say is that to be a sustainable ethical brand, you need to be transparent about your impact. You need to be telling consumers, other stakeholders, civil society, the, the population at large, what are your impacts on the things that matter? What are your impacts on climate, biodiversity, pollution, um, 
workers living, workers being paid properly and workers working in safe conditions and so on. And so we looked at how many of the brands that, um, of the high street brands, so we divide our ratings into large and small brands. So of the large brands, about two fifths of the brands we've rated, many hundreds of brands. Um, 70%, the first thing that you, you need to do to be transparent is to know where your stuff is made. Like, can you trace your supply chain? Do you know where the cotton and um, polyester or viscose or whatever in your supply chain is coming from? Do you know where, where, where it was processed, the textile mills? Do you know who's cut, make, trim your clothes? Now, not surprisingly, um, uh, more than half know where their um, the, the top tier of their supply chain. They know where the clothes are put together. In fact, 70%, 77%. 77% of uh, large brands state that they can trace their all of their top tier suppliers. But when it comes to their second tier, the textile mills, the processing of the fabrics or the first tier, it falls to 5%, less than 5% of those large brands, of the 800 or so large brands, 1,000 large brands can trace um, where, their, where their stuff is coming from. And if we look at how many are actually communicating this to customers, 25% are not even telling their customers which country the clothes are made in, let alone where the factories are or, or under what conditions they're made. And as for the second tier and the first tier, well, I don't even know, so it's not surprising they're not telling us. So um, that I think is, you know, in terms of where they're going, they need to know more about their own supply chain before they can improve it. I think that's it's starting from a long way behind where they need to be. Thank you, Gordon. Really important points you've made about transparency. Um, I'll come to Lynn with the, with the same question. Maybe you want to um, comment on, on what uh, Gordon has said. Yeah, so Gordon has summed that up perfectly, and um, I don't really have much more to add on that. But what I would like to do is take the conversation a wee bit further in saying and thinking about what is the high street offering for the consumer? So at the moment, and Ian touched on this in terms of the things that Zero Waste Scotland uh, do with Revolve, etc. The challenge is that we still have this linear retail model. And so in terms of, yes, we can have transparency in the supply chain, and we really need that. The consumer has virtually no accessible information at the moment in a way that a family of four can access it really quickly and make decisions quickly. But what we really need and what is missing from the high street are those rental models, those leasing models, those fashion libraries that allow this, um, uh, don't um, encourage an instant culture, but allow a more free consumer culture with clothing, that allow, that offer a more um, open offering that isn't just about owning something that it allows the consumer freedom um, in a way that you just don't see on the high street uh, right now. Um, and what is wonderful is I do see in small communities in Scotland, people setting up rental businesses, both online and in the high street. Uh, there's some great new ethical and sustainable brands happening in Scotland. Uh, and we just need to encourage more of that. And we need to rethink the high street. So I think, um, yeah, in terms of Gordon setting out the issue, it's then what does that look like from the high street perspective, from the consumer perspective, uh, trying to access the high street, and how do we start to encourage and tackle a new way of fashion consumption? Thank you. I hope you don't mind me, Monica. Oh, You've briefly been back on mute there, so I didn't catch all of that, Lynn. Oh, sorry. I was just saying, I hope you don't mind me uh, sort of taking a, an alternative take on the high street, just to add on to Gordon, because he did such no, a good uh, overview. It's great to get your unique uh, perspective. Um, I mean, Ian, you mentioned the Revolve Network, uh, which I know from, from my local communities here in Lanarkshire, and you talked about CIODA. I just wondered, um, do you think we're seeing enough of a momentum? Um, you know, we've got more fashion aware young people moving away from the, the high street in its traditional sense towards vintage shopping. We've got Depop. Um, we're seeing more interest in, in hiring uh, wedding wear, formal wear, dresses, and so on. But you know, are we seeing enough momentum around that, Ian? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. 
I mean, at one level, on a personal level, I think there is because I'm obviously, you know, Zero Waste Scotland. We work with businesses around the space, and we work with consumers. And also, you know, anecdotally, <laughs> I have two uh, teenage daughters who who shop vintage, who use Depop, and all these sort of things. So I'm very, it's very, I'm very aware of that, and I'm aware of these platforms and how they're developing. Uh, so clearly, it feels like there is momentum. And I think that's very positive, and I think you know, obviously it's, it is particularly being driven by younger people. Uh, and you know the, the Revolve network does help. It mainstreams and raises the profile of second hand uh, across Scotland and making it more accessible. But I think at the same time, we're, you know, online consumption is relatively easy, very easy for for people uh, to you know in terms of consumption, and it's been it's possibly been you know relied upon a lot during the kind of pandemic when we couldn't get out to the shops. So people are getting that. So it's almost like we're we're competing still. <laughs> There's still a lot of easy throwaway you know uh, frameworks out there in terms of uh, you know getting things quick and using them and once and throwing them away but i do think momentum shifting and and i'm encouraged by that and i think but i mean going back to the i think the point that uh, that Lynn is making it is about the accessibilities they offer not just online but in the shops uh, are the big retailers are the big brands you know Giving information about this, talking about alternatives, or even taking take back themselves. I mean, you know, some shops prior to the pandemic were looking at that. Even some of the main, the big retailers were looking at you know shopping and things like that, bringing offering incentives for people to bring stuff back. So I think there's a, there's more of a role that they could do in terms of mainstreaming it. So it's not something you have to hunt out, you know, the secondhand shops or, or such like. You, you see it much more in the in the kind of mainstream. But I do think it's a bit of the offer, and I think the the transparency thing is really. Yeah, I, I agree. And we work with a lot of businesses, a lot of corporates uh, in the circular economy space, not just in fashion. And I think there is a nervousness because they know that they need to get this right. But why they're not talking about it is because they know if somebody comes and asks them the question that they cannot provide that information. So there's, there's a kind of real appetite at the moment for a lot of corporates to try and get that sorted. But in the meantime, you know, they're saying, look, we're not telling anybody because, you know, it's embarrassing because uh, we don't know it. So I think there's a real shift, and I think that is driven a lot by consumer pressure of saying, look, we really want to find out where this stuff is coming from, and you need to tell us. Uh, so I think, well, that's another thing that's definitely happening at pace, I, I, I believe. But as I think as Lynn's saying, all the transparency is great, you know, putting a label on it saying it's eco is brilliant, but if people just think, well, that's fine, I can just buy that, and I can wear it once and throw it away, then <laughs> it's not actually achieving what we're trying to do. And I think that's that's a little bit of the concern about, you know, transparency. Yes, we need to do it. Yes, we need to, you know, put pressure on uh, the brands. But ultimately, is that just going to make it more guilt-free for people to shop? Then that's, that's you know, still going to create uh, significant problems globally in terms of the environment and possibly, you know, the knock-on effects in terms of throwaway culture is not going to be addressed. So uh, we need to kind of, you know, focus the upstream activity uh, far more as well. Can I just add that um, it's definitely true that transparency is not a solution itself. It's a starting point, and that um, once brands are transparent, you can start to address, uh, assess how they're tackling the full range of material impacts, including to what extent they're engaging with the circular economy. So, if you take good on use brand assessment methodologies, for example, if you know brands will get a higher score if they offer resale programs, they'll have a higher score if they have long-lasting, high-quality garments, which is the other side of the circular economy thing. Is I think that will in fact last, um, and so on. Going back to your actual question about the um, original question about the, the the degree of interest. I mean, what's really interesting is I mean, we we have um, and we're a small, tiny startup from Australia, but we have one million people each month looking at our um, site, looking for information about sustainable fashion, looking to check out which brands are better. And um, I think the other thing to just to bring together something that Ian and Lynn have been saying is that from a consumer point of view, there's a lot of information out there. What, do you, what should you think about the most? And I think there are probably probably four things. One is, um, you know, think about how you can consume in a more long-lasting way. And I think that has three elements. One is exactly what Lynn said, where appropriate, use a, a rental model or a resale model. Uh, the second one is, uh, if it's your taste, get involved in repairs or even upcycling. So you, you can fix things. Back back in my, I'm, I'm not so young, but back in my mother's day and my grandmother's day, there's a lot of fixing going on. You know, I was sitting around, um, gendered as it was, um, fixing people's clothes. And that's not so common these days. So first one, buy in a way that's sustainable. First of all, buy high quality 
resale or um, re um, rental, and then secondly, repair. And then the third one is when you do buy new, buy from a sustainable brand. And just going back to the fast fashion mindset, sometimes people object to buying higher quality um, sustainable clothes on the basis that they cost more. And the really interesting thing about fashion is that the price, we, we spend as households the same amount of money we spent on clothes 20 years ago. 7% of household income is allocated to clothing, same proportion 20, 30 years ago. But we buy four times as much stuff with that money. So the price has gone down by two, three, 400%. And so what, if your mother or grandmother was teleported into today's um, 20 year old culture, they would not think that sustainable fashion was expensive. That would be the normal price for clothes. And so it's that marketing element saying, you can't wear that anymore. You have to change it, you have to change it. That is an essential you know, driver of this overconsumption, I think, and something not to be forgotten. Thank you, Gordon. Now, this is all really fascinating, but we've got our audience with us today. Some people may um, be hearing something that's familiar to them, but others might be quite new to the topic. So, got a really interesting point and question from Dewey, which I'm going to uh, point to Ian to answer. It might be slightly technical, but we've made the points about transparency in terms of the the, the manufacturers uh, and, and the brands. Um, I think Dewey is finding it a little hard to accept, Ian, your contention that each person discards eight tonnes of material a year. It does sound an enormous amount. So, would you be able to clarify for Dewey um, the basis for that, for that data? How, how um, are, are these measurements uh, collated and, and how can we be transparent around that? Ian. Yeah, so we produced a report uh, earlier this summer, which is basically Scotland's material flow account, which basically uh, understands the, the, all of the materials that we consume here in Scotland, or uh, some of which obviously you know we export. So we export material uh, to other parts of the world. So it's a kind of our total footprint in terms of material for Scotland is something in the region of 100 million tonnes that we consume into our economy, uh, both from uh, raw materials here in Scotland and imports. So that 100 million tonnes goes into our economy, you know, but that basically works out to 18.4 tonnes per person. So it's it's our economy that is is consuming it, but we, as part of that consumption, both uh, independently as consumers, but also in the, you know, through the businesses and the, you know, the public se sector spend as well. So it's an average per person, and it's really just demonstrating that Scotland is, you know, consuming way above the more sustainable level of eight. That's what scientists would say. The most sustainable for an economy is eight tons per person per year, but we're at eighteen point four. So, you know, we're all responsible for that, and you know, not just what we do at home, but you know, the, the wider economy as well. And driving cars or whatever, all of that consumes uh, raw materials, and the infrastructure that we use and you know are, is deployed on our benefits. You know, consumes materials. Thank you for that, Ian. So I wonder. Um, we've talked about legislation and, and transparency and, and, and labelling. I suppose mislabeling, because sometimes we do see things um, marketed as or organic or eco-friendly, but Gordon touched on this concept of greenwashing. So I wonder, um, I'll, I'll come to Lynn first of all, and then, and then perhaps Gordon, but how important is legislation and enforcement around labelling? Yeah, so in the um, uh, the fixing fashion report that was that the UK government was involved in, in that um, the the fashion campaign, fashion revolution, fashion campaigners were really calling for a due diligence law, and that due diligence law goes beyond the modern slavery act, and that's about ensuring that. Um, Brands are identifying their supply chain and making it public. And uh, things like preventing modern slavery and environmental pollution by knowing what's in their supply chain. So what Gordon is saying, but putting this into a due diligence law. And uh, and this is so that they can so that the brands can mitigate and ultimately account for how uh, their how they manage what they're actually doing. So it's also to uh, act as a, a, a lever for the brands to be able to to follow guidelines, to follow a law that they, they need to comply with, but it should be helpful for everyone. 
And um, in relation to that, uh, sorry, I've got some notes here. I just wanted to, to get my facts right. So that's why I've got some notes. And um, so it's the idea of um, something like a public database of companies, um, that just like Gordon's company does at the moment, where they are a, a non-profit, Gordon, or a for-profit, your company? We're a social impact for-profit. Okay. So, um, but if something like that was mandatory for consumers, where they could go and uh, identify a brand um, and identify what they're doing, but they also in this report um, recommend it for public procurement. And I think this is really interesting, given that uh, I think at the start in, in the global pandemic, um, CEPA reported that 6,000 tonnes of face coverings were estimated to have been landfilled in the first stage of the pandemic. So this pandemic has, from a, a, our own personal procurement, but from a public procurement perspective, meant a real impact on single-use devices, um, such as uh, syringes and face coverings. And so looking at what does that due diligence law mean for uh, consumers in terms of our public uh, sphere, as well as our own personal consumption, uh, would be really important uh, under this law. And so, um, yeah, I think that from my perspective, that's um, the idea of a due diligence law is something that really um, could be, be looked into a lot further, and maybe maybe something that Scotland could could really um, champion. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, I, 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 oh, sorry. Just, just briefly, um, yeah, Lynn mentioned SEPA. So, for anyone who's not within Scotland today, that's the Scottish right. Environment Protection Agency. Yeah, Gordon, a due diligence law. Do we need that? Yeah, I think something like that is a good idea. So, you asked about um, should we focus on claims that um, companies are making, which may be not entirely true or false. I think that is partly it's already the law, so it's really just a question of enforcement. I mean, companies may not mislead, but I think it's also perhaps. Uh, it's an interesting issue, but it's not the, the core issue, which really is something like a due diligence law or um, uh, perhaps a different version of the same thing, which is saying that companies should be required to disclose their impacts on modern slavery or their impacts on carbon use. And so a law which says disclose your total CO2 to emissions across your supply chain. I mean, that's a, quite a simple idea. It doesn't require the companies to produce in one way or another. It just requires them to tell us how they're doing it. And this relates to a really important idea here. Sometimes when we think about, particularly about sustainability, we think, oh, those consumers, they're consuming all that stuff. They're very bad people. We should beat them up and make them feel guilty. And firstly, that doesn't work. And secondly, it's not the way I think about it at all. It's the opposite. We know that a majority of people say that they want to consume more sustainably. We know that about half of them actually feel bad when they're not able to consume more sustainably. So the motivation's there. What's the problem is that it's actually hard to do. That's the first thing. And secondly, consumers do have competing priorities and we have to think about how they, how they relate together. So nobody goes out, nobody who says, hey, I want to be sustainable, goes out to buy a sustainable piece of clothing. They're going to buy a piece of clothing because they have a particular need that they perceive. They, they want to dress to wear at a party, they want a suit to wear to work, whatever it may be. And so, um, so the framing I think is much better is to say consumers, it's not you are obliged to buy the right stuff, it's you have a right to consume responsibly, you have a right to consume sustainably and business and government need to support consumers to more easily exercise that right. And so a law which it requires brands to be transparent, a much stronger modern slavery act combined with um, legislation which talks about other key issues like um, greenhouse gas impacts or deforestation impacts. Um, would be far more useful, I think, than simply policing false green claims. So that would give um, civil society, other companies, regulators and companies like mine, the information we need to provide consumers with really easy to use information, which will help them make more sustainable choices and in turn drive companies to um, do better, simply because that's the way they're going to survive in the competitive marketplace. Thank you. Earlier on, Gordon, you talked about viscose and deforestation. So Francis has picked up on that, and Francis is asking 
um, well, she's saying it's a fascinating point about viscose and is asking, is there an alternative with the same mm -hmm. properties? Um, can more be done to make this tree use more more widely known about? Come to Gordon, but yep. then I know Lynn, you're our textiles expert. So uh, mm -hmm. Gordon yep. and Lynn, and you know, I don't know if Ian wants to add anything. So I'll be really quick, and I'm sure Lynn has some more detailed knowledge, but the three most commonly used textiles, as I understand it, are polyester, which is basically oil and has big climate change impacts. Cotton, which is natural, inverted commas, but actually has a huge amount of impacts on the environment. If you think about cotton, it's a nice fluffy ball, and you think about that nice shiny shirt you're wearing, it's kind of not fluffy anymore. So to get from state A to state B took a lot of to grow it took a lot of water and pesticides to get to that state took a lot of chemicals so business as usual cotton is a really big polluter and then the third most common material is viscose which is made by turning trees into a nice rayon like fabric well rayon is a form of viscose and so to turn you've got two issues there one is the trees you cut them down that's kind of bad particularly our old growth forests or so we're not not you know plantations and secondly, to turn them into um, a fabric requires a lot of chemicals. And so to be sustainable, you have to address both those things. So some brands have made sure that the trees that they are using to create viscose are from um, FSC, Foreign Stewardship Council Certified Sustainable Forest. So that's a good start. And other people are looking at um, making sure the chemical process uh, is um, as little pollution as possible, as, as much of a closed loop as possible. And so there's a product called Tensile, which is not 100% the same as viscose in terms of its quality, but it's getting closer. Lynn will probably have more to say about that. So um, just finally, for each of those three main materials, polyester, cotton, and viscose, I'm oh, sorry, um, there is an alternative material which has half the greenhouse gas impact, which respectively are organic cotton, um, recycled polyester, and uh, tensile. They don't, they're not perfect, those materials, but they're better than the business as usual material. Thank you. Lynn? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a really nice summary, Gordon, of uh, what's going on in terms of fibres. Um, and so just to push that a little further, what's really interesting in the UK is a surge in people looking at growing hemp. And um, uh, you might not be familiar with this, Gordon. In the UK, we have a programme called the Great British Sewing Bee. And there's a chap called Patrick Grant from the Great British Sewing Bee. And I know that Patrick, in his um, site in the north of England, has a started a hemp project. So he's going to, to grow the hemp to see how much of a garment they can get uh, from this hemp. And it is a, an experimental project, but it is about this idea of demonstrating what the value of a fibre is. So whilst we can ask, about the properties of viscose compared to polyester or cotton. The actual question is, what do we want to do with this fiber? Where are we going to use it? How is it going to be used? And how long is it going to be used for? So that there are some things that we do need in fast cycles. There are some things that we need in much slower cycles. So it's really evaluating with all of these different fibers, what's the best use of them? And, and to ensure they have a second life after we've used them. And so I think the idea of uh, addressing head on in the UK, what are we doing with fibre? How can we get back to natural fibre by growing our own is really interesting. And, and these, of course, are micro projects and they're not the answer, but they, they help us to identify um, potential uh, new fibre streams, because I think because we're so polyester dependent, over 63% of the clothing we wear is polymer based. And I think even as consumers, we maybe don't understand that the, the, that polymer base is the same base as in a plastic bottle, which is why we can re reprocess uh, process, um, polyester clothing back into new clothing as we can with, with plastic bottles. But we know that we can only do that two or three times. It's not an infinite loop. Um, potentially, as technology goes forward, it might become an infinite loop, but we, we don't have that for sure. But what we do need is much more a broad range of fibres and understanding what we want them to do so that we reduce our need uh, for polymer-based fibres and reduce our need for, for oil. So, yeah, I hope that's 
added uh, further. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Lynn. No, it's great to have all your contributions today. Ian, do you want to add anything to that? Well, a couple of points. Just, I mean, going back to a previous answer from uh, Gordon about uh, consumers. Absolutely, I think you know, it's too too easy to blame consumers. Uh, you know, but you know, I, I echo what you said. I don't think people don't get up. You know, with a particular purpose to go and trash the planet or to you know support slavery. You know, that, that's not what people do. You know, people you know are really, I think, very keen to make the right choices and you know, but are hampered in a way that we're talking about in terms of the system that they're uh, confronted with. Uh, and that's the same. We have the same discussion with consumers around food waste. You know, the whole you know the whole aspects of how uh, food is presented to them at retail level. So I think yeah, it is about how do we help them make. You know, how do we change the system, but how do we also offer up alternatives? And it comes back to things like buying second hand and making these things much more available to, to, to us all. Uh, I was like, I'm just I was taking some notes about the, the due diligence law that uh, you were both talking about, Lynn and, and Gordon, because I mean obviously as you'll know, Monica, the opportunity uh, in terms of uh, uh, things to go into the proposed circular economy bill here in Scotland, uh, which is been put forward by our government. Uh, obviously, no timetable for that yet, but these are the things that I think we should be thinking about. You know, like how, what, how can we use that enabling legislation here in Scotland to obviously create much more circular uh, economy here in Scotland, but you know, address some of those issues. Not, not, a, and, and certainly not just about how do we restrict things, but also how do we open up these opportunities for for people to 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 become more circular. So that's, that was really interesting. I'm not obviously a fibre expert. Uh, but I am interested in that, obviously, as Lynn will know, the whole plastic bottles opportunity uh, to, to go back into other things like you know textiles or uh, across the, the wider piece as well. And one of the things that we're very interested in is we've Scotland has uh, moving to on board onshore quite a lot of uh, uh, what you might call it uh, healthcare uh, protection equipment. You know, in terms of plastics in the back of the pandemic, there's a, there's an opportunity as well for you know reusing plastic material from our waste streams, both at household level and industrial levels, to get that back into you know uh, PPE equipment, which is can be used and then recycled again. So that is a potential opportunity around the circular economy as we we look to to build a resilience in our supply chains around PPE equipment uh, and using the raw materials that we already have in our waste stream. Uh, it just makes you know perfect sense. Thank you, Ian. I'm going to stick with you for a moment longer because we've talked a lot about what governments can do in terms of legislation and enforcement. But we've got a question from Arlene, and she's asking: Should governments introduce higher rate of tax on fast fashion companies and their products? To encourage companies to move away from high volume turnaround products. Any well, thoughts on that, Ian? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, again, it comes back to that thing: do you penalise or incentivise? So clearly, there, there are our conversations in other uh, countries around introducing levies, you know, on on fast fashion or or you know, fashion full stop, uh, you know, and creating a kind of almost uh, extended producer responsibility, it's called. So putting some responsibility onto the fashion brands and retail to, you know, provide the infrastructure, provide the the, the, the money to provide the collection infrastructure, uh, etc. And that to create much more closed loops uh, approaches to uh, fabric uh, reprocessing, etc. So that that is a potential an opportunity, yes. Uh, but the other thing we, you know, quite quite keen on is how could you actually reduce uh, taxation, you know, particularly things like VAT, for to encourage more reuse and repair. So there's a there's a it's a pilot in Sweden where they've reduced VAT on exactly that reuse repair, both both in terms of textiles, furniture, bikes, you name it, uh, and you know to encourage more uh, not just social enterprises but entrepreneurs to get into that space. Uh, so that's the kind of so again, it's not so much taxing the bad, uh, but actually how do we incentivise the good? Uh, because, as we just talked about, I think that's where people are looking. People are looking how, what, where's the incentive for me to be in part of this, both as a business and as an entrepreneur potentially, and also as a consumer. So, incentivising people in that space, I think, is uh, we could get much further without, you know, changing tax systems. Full stop. 
even business rates, local business rates, you know, things like that, being creative to create a, the much more of a kind of reuse, repair hub or infrastructure at a local level. How do you incentivise more? And I mean, you mentioned high streets right at the beginning of the discussion. So how do we create more space for those people to provide those services and much more accessibly to the consumer in the first place? Thanks, Dean. So we're getting into carrots and sticks here. Um, I'll come to Lynn and Gordon just briefly because we do have lots of other questions to come through. But Lynn and then Gordon, just your thoughts on, on what you've just heard? Yeah, I mean, reducing um, something, incentivising uh, renting and leasing, that's something that's being really looked into. Um, and companies, uh, we have a fantastic company in um, Scotland called ACS Clothing, and they're a, a rental service company who provide um, cleaning services for the whole of the UK. And they're really advocating for taking the VAT off of rental and incentivising the consumer, encouraging the consumer in in that kind of um, in that kind of way. And so, uh, yeah, I, I'm really for incentivising more so. I probably know more about incentivisation than taxation, and so yeah, I, I think anything that really benefits the consumer is is the way forward. And one one perspective I can add to that is that um, <clears throat> the ability of the consumer to find a sustainable option varies a lot um, in the categories of clothes and the price point. Um, people will often say it's hard to find um, sustainable options at small at lower prices and that, that's a particular challenge but there are particular kinds of products and uh, other aspects of clothing which are not well addressed by existing sustainable fashion brands um so plus size is quite hard to find uh sustainable fashion in a plus size um we have found that one of the items that's most searched on good on you is in fact shoes but there are many less sustainable shoe brands than there are um uh, so, so I think some some government support in, in terms of guidance to the industry saying, hey, you know, this, when when you're thinking about, so I think the problem is that people go away and they think I'm going to start a fast fashion brand, and they and they think of two things first. They think of, okay, so that means organic cotton, and that means t-shirts, right? And there are a lot of organic cotton t-shirt brands out there. We don't need any more organic cotton t-shirt brands right now. Um, what we do need is brands that are doing things, like really creative brand that I know is saying. Okay, your child is growing, and, and you you don't feel like spending a lot of money for your three year old because they're going to be four soon, and they're not going to be wearing that. So, what are the systems around that? And, and of course, clothes swaps and 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 so forth are good, but brands which say actually you give us that back, and we will give you the next size, like for nothing or for ten percent or something, um, or even making clothes which expand. I mean, there's some great options there. So there are very specific problems that are opportunities for businesses. And so I think some work by government or others, including us, to kind of highlight that opportunity is, is a really interesting um, way forward. I just want to say one thing about um, looking at recycling um, pet bottles that, that Ian mentioned. Um, I said before that the, the, the recycled polyester is, is roughly speaking 50% less greenhouse gas emissions than regular polyester. But unfortunately, it's equally bad on the microplastics issue, that is small, shedding of fibres that get into the, the water stream in particular and get into fish and get into us when we eat the fish. Um, uh, and so there's a difference between, so recycled products which get washed a lot has that problem. So active wear made out of recycled polyester, maybe that's not great. Recycled products which tend to get hand washed like swimwear, much less bad. Recycled products which you almost never wash like shoes. So let's, let's focus on making some sustainable shoes out of recycled pet because that would also not have that, you know, unwanted uh, secondary attribute. Great. I'm giving you a project there. Thank you, Gordon. I'm going to try and squeeze in a few more questions. So I won't come to every panel member. Um, just really quickly, um, this is for Lynn. Rubina is asking, should wool be used more widely? Again, it goes back to my um, point of what's it for? So wool is a brilliant insulator. We have real issues with um, uh, fuel poverty at the moment. And so, of course, we should all have really good um, wool products. And it's a challenge because to get a really good wool product that's 100% wool, the ad can be expensive. Um, so wool is really important. But again, the challenge is that consumers don't often realise that they're not buying wool. 
And because we have such sophisticated uh, fibre systems at the moment, we can be hoodwinked into thinking we're buying wool when we're actually buying polyester that doesn't have the same uh, insulating properties. And so wool is a wonderful uh, fibre and it is a, a travesty that um, farmers in the UK cannot get uh, money for their fleece. And so it's, it's just um, an economic, uneconomic for them to sell their fleece, so they have to burn it. And, um, and so the idea of, of bringing back um, more wool production in the UK would be a really uh, fantastic thing, but it has so many challenges. But what we do see is we see um, small croft communities, um, small crofters developing new fibres along the, the sort of animal chain, whether it's um, alpaca or yak or um, llama, and, uh, as well as, as wool fibres. And so again, these small batch manufacturers who are then can create these fabulous products, that I think the challenge is that they are then um, quite uh, expensive. So that's when we can potentially look at a seasonal wardrobe. Can we lease a seasonal wardrobe? Can we lease our woolens? How do we circulate them more? So again, it goes back to what is it that we want wool to do? It is one of our key, most important fibres, but it's working with design and consumption to work out what do we want it to do. Thank you, Lynn. I just want to pick up on um, a, a question and a comment really from Margaret Caldwell, who's joined us today. Margaret is a concerned consumer. And she feels that the fast fashion industry is exploitative, both in terms of production and marketing. And nothing she's hearing makes her change that opinion. But she is glad to hear of initiatives um, to challenge that. We have touched on it briefly because we only have 60 minutes today. But we know that sustainable fashion um, has a, a, a close link with the, the labour unions and interest in this exploitation of, of garment workers around the, the globe. I wonder, Gordon, just maybe in a few seconds, can you say, are we still seeing these big brands still too wedded to their profit margins, or are we seeing an improvement in garment workers' terms and conditions? I, I think we can so I'll try and be really quick. So 2013, terrible disaster in Bangladesh. Many people died in the factory collapse, and the fashion revolution movement was born, and this focus on transparency was born. And there has been a lot of steps forward in transparency about supply chains by many, but not all brands. Um, but saying that, over the last eight, nine years, I would say that we've made more progress on environmental issues than on labour issues. And you know, some of the big brands, including HM, made promises to pay living wages to workers, which they by a certain time frame, which they failed to meet and sort of admitted that and sort of the promises faded away. And so uh, and then came COVID, you know, and we had and the first thing that the 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 fashion brands did when they were losing sales was to cancel orders and they had terrible impacts on workers in the supply chain who whose bosses were not getting paid and so they weren't getting paid by their by the, the mills or the cut matrix factories in, in Bangladesh and Cambodia and so on. So um there is still a lot, you know, I would say there's more awareness around it, there's more commitment to transparency from a substantial minority um of the industry leaders, but there's a long way to go into actually delivering fair working conditions. Um you know, so there's, there's been a few bright spots, but, uh, you know, we're not there. Thank you, Gordon. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to move on so we can come to some closing remarks. But I want to thank everyone uh, for their comments and questions. Um, a, a nice comment from Sharon in the event chat. Um, Ian mentioned Zero Waste Scotland's um, work with the Revolve Network. and Sharon is saying that she donated the majority of her mother's clothes to Revolve and linked with the local women's aid so that they could use the, the points. Um, so thank you, Sharon, for, for sharing that with us. Um, thank you uh, all for your contributions. Um, before we come to close the event, I would like to give each of our panellists just one minute to sum up the issues raised in our discussion today. And if I can begin with Ian, we'll then move to Lynn and end with Gordon.
And if we can unmute Ian, we'll hear from him. Uh, am I unmuted now? Yes, thanks. And uh, thanks for the opportunity again. Uh, it's probably it's that issue. I mean, I guess what we're trying to do is, to some extent, show that there is an alternative to fast fashion, or as one of the present, presenters talked about, the exploitation, to some extent, of, of what consumers are thinking. Uh, so that's what it's about for us. There is an alternative, you know, there is, you know, trying to give that, you know, opportunities here in Scotland to grow and develop, both as a business, you know, and as a social movement as well. But, you know, and giving, you know, more power to the consumer to some, some extent to, to make, you know, the right choices. Uh, but yeah, I mean, another thing I think probably haven't talked about, uh, you know, I think God talked about the cost of fashion, you know, is we should all use what we already have. I think there's a statistic around that the average UK household has £4,000 worth of clothing uh, in their wardrobes, uh, a third of which we haven't worn in a year. You know, so there again, just, you know, before we even start thinking about where we're going to buy stuff, you know, use what we've already got in our, <laughs> in our wardrobes. Uh, there's valuable uh, clothing there. Thank you, Ian and uh, Lynn. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I attended um, the talk by George Mombio at the Festival of Politics the other night, and he has a fantastic concept that I think really can be applied to fashion, and it's called, he says, private sufficiency, public luxury. And I think private sufficiency is what Ian's talking about, that 30% reduction in our, the 30% of the average wardrobe is never worn. How do we really uh, support new cons our, us as consumers, new consumers to understand what sufficiencies do we need in our wardrobe? So about education, but then public luxury, that's about ensuring quality, that everybody has the right to quality and that uh, we don't have this Low grade, low quality fashion anymore. We have this uh, clothing should be a public luxury that then supports us with things that basic human needs, keeping us warm, keeping us cool, keeping us dry, keeping us safe. All of these basic human needs is are really what clothing is about, and we need to get back to that um, public luxury position. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn Gordon. And, um, <clears throat> so I just want to say two things that consumers can think about doing it. One thing government should do. So just building on everything that's been said, one of the ways to make sure we don't have things in our wardrobe that we don't wear is to be better and more mindful shoppers. And so two rules of thumb. One is look at something and you ask yourself, will I wear this X number of times? Will I wear this 20 times? And if the answer is no, maybe don't buy it. And the second thing is, don't look at the sticker price, look at the price per wear. So if you see something, you look at it, you think, I'm only going to wear that twice. That means it costs five pounds per wear or 10 pounds per wear. And you look at something else, the woolen items that Linda's talking about, it's 50 quid, but actually I'm going to wear that 20 times a year for the next five years. That's a hundred times. So it's whatever that is, 50p per wear. And so it's 10 times cheaper than the five or 10 pound skirt that was going to fall apart next week. So. That's two things for consumers and very quickly for government, I think just reiterating, making it easy for consumers, most of whom want to do the right thing to do that, starting point is obligation to be transparent um, on brands. Thank you. Thank you. And we must end here. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and making such a big contribution to our panel brought to you in partnership with Zero Waste Scotland. I'd like to thank our excellent panel, Lynn Wilson, Gordon Rainouf and Ian Gulland for giving up their time and to take part. And finally, can I take the opportunity to remind you that later on today, we have panel discussions about climate activism and this is not a drill. And then at 7.30 p.m. tonight, an in conversation with the world-renowned scientist, Professor Suzanne Simard, whose revolutionary work on the world of trees is being made into a Hollywood biopic. And tomorrow we have discussions on everything from mental health to resilient cities and inventions to save the world from the climate crisis. I do hope you can enjoy you can join these discussions and enjoy them. And uh, goodbye from us. Thank you and take care. <laughs>